All right, you ready, Dean Rashad? Let's go. So we're sitting here in this space where you have spent a lot of time, both mm -hmm. as a student here at Howard and now as the soon-to-be outgoing dean of this esteemed College of Fine Arts. I just wonder, before we even get started, what memories you must have from this space? Well, uh, we're in <clears throat> the Ira Aldrich Theater, and this space is the space in which I had my acting one class, freshman year, um, was in this space. This is a space in which, when I think about it, all of my acting classes were in this space every year. And uh, this is a space in which I moved sets around. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this is a space in which I rehearsed and performed. This is a space uh, in which I viewed new works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is a space in which I received acknowledgement. This is a space in which I've frolicked. This is a space <laughs> that I've shared. Mm -hmm. I've shared. You grew here. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you're growing here. All the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So tell me, before you came here as the dean, you were acting, you were directing, you were doing all of the things that made you happy. And then someone has a conversation with you. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to persuade you to come back to Howard to mm -hmm. take this role. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that conversation. <laughs> what made you say yes? I didn't say yes. Mm. <laughs> I didn't say yes. Well, I'll just say this conversation, uh, there was strategy behind this conversation. There were several conversations. But the one in particular to which I think you are referring is a lunch that I had with Chadwick Boseman. That was strategically arranged <laughs> by Dr. Frederick. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, president emeritus of Howard University. And in this conversation, uh, Chad, who had been a champion of fine arts throughout his uh, time as a student, informed me that the college was going to be reestablished after having been under the auspices of liberal arts, or the umbrella, I should say, of liberal arts for a number of years. He said, yes, it's, it's going to be it's coming back, it's going to be established, and I think you should be the dean. I looked at him and laughed. I did, I said, oh please, tell oh, please, I used to, come on, <laughs> you know? He said, no, no, I, I, really, I really think, he said, I think you would be a good dean. Said, okay, Chadley. So um, I followed along and received a position description, and when I read the position description, all of which made sense for what a dean is and how a dean serves. I also saw that there was no room for creative work. Hmm. You know, the creative work that I had been doing. And so I said, mm, I am not ready to retire from my creative work. So I declined the invitation to apply. Some months passed, and so did Chadwick. Mm -hmm. And one day, I was sitting in my office looking at his face on the magazines I had collected that had written about him, and hearing him say, no, you really should, you really should consider it. I think you should apply. And I thought, well, I declined that invitation, but I didn't tell him why. So I called to give explanation. And I was told, is that all? Is that what it was? I said, yes. Well, I think you should apply. <laughs> so, I, so I did. <clears throat> Prior to, <clears throat> pardon me, mm -hmm. <clears throat> allergies. It's okay. <clears throat> Prior to receiving the appointment, there were several professional obligations that I had made contracts that had been signed. 
So it meant that in the first year of my tenure as dean, I would be away a significant amount of time. Well, let me backtrack and say, I went through the entire process mm -hmm. of candidacy, as all candidates do. Mm -hmm. There are a series of interviews um, that one must do, um, documents that must be submitted, the whole thing. I went through the whole process. And then one day I received this call that said, congratulations, you are the inaugural dean of the Chadwick A. Bozeman College of Fine Arts. And I thought, okay, this is gonna require real organization time management before <laughs> that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely it did. Well, the biggest thing in, in arriving as dean um, to this unit that had not been its own unit for over two decades was there was no infrastructure. Mm -hmm. I you know had to, you had to lay a, uh, some groundwork here. People don't think actors think this way, but we do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I knew that I needed a very strong assistant, and I knew who that person was, Denise Saunders Thompson. She had been uh, working at Howard University. She worked here for 18 years. Uh, she was left and she went to American University and she founded the International Association of Blacks in Dance. She was a great administrator. <clears throat> full knowledge of the programs, full knowledge of university procedures and process and people. <coughs> people mm -hmm. are very important. Mm -hmm. People matter, people count. When you're trying to put together that infrastructure, you need the support of the administration, which we always had. Mm -hmm. We enjoy tremendous support. You need the well wishes of other deans, which we've always had. And you need to choose the right people, people with the right temperament, people with the understanding of the artistic disciplines here, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and people who understand how to navigate procedures within the university correctly, openly, transparently. Mm -hmm. And so I was very fortunate to have those things. And it was a build. It didn't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. And even as this was happening, <coughs> students were arriving. Students were arriving with expectations, and we had to meet those expectations. Faculty needed to <clears throat> be, how should I say, assured that they were seen and that they are valued. It is very important to acknowledge faculty. <laughs> you don't have a college without any more than you have a college without students. You just don't. These were the kinds of things that needed to happen. And then affiliations needed to be entered into. Mm -hmm. Affiliations with corporations who were sponsoring one thing and another. There was equipment that needed to be had. There were so many things that needed to be had. Then there was the band, mm. Showtime Marching Band. Mm -hmm. How are you gonna organize that uh, that is placed in the office of the dean and mm -hmm. ensure that, hey, the band is going to eat, they're going to be fed, mm -hmm. and they're going to be fed good food. Mm -hmm. You know, how to create a culture of shared understanding, hmm? mutual respect, how to foster that through one's own actions. Sounds like there was a lot of nation building to do all the way around. Well, yeah, and the nation was here. Mm -hmm. They were already here. Mm -hmm. They were already here. And I have to say this, well, needless to say, I think you feel this from me already. This is a very special place. There's no place else like Howard University, and there's no place else like the College of Fine Arts, the Chadwick A. Bozeman College of Fine Arts. There's no place like it. 
So you had a very special relationship with Chadwick Boseman. You mentored him. He looked up to you dearly, obviously mm -hmm. asked you the big question, believed in you, believed that you could excel and amplify the role and the college. And to know that this institution you lead bears his name, mm -hmm. that has to be doubly special for you. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. It gives meaning to me and my presence here every day. Because in the midst of everything else, this is always what's inside me, mm -hmm. that his name is here. And his name is not here because he was Black Panther. Mm -hmm. No, no. His name is here because he was a scholar. Oh, he was incredible. As a student, he wanted to know everything there was to know about theater, about art, about music. He was a biblical scholar as well. He was an activist, a social activist, bent on justice. Mm -hmm. Walk into the classroom, we can't have class today. We've got to go seek justice, this is what he <laughs> would say. And he was serious about it. And he was intelligent about it. And he was purposeful about it. And when he returned to give the commencement address, he spoke about purpose, finding that for oneself. Is that one of the biggest responsibilities you have as the dean for the young people who come here to help them find their purpose artistically and and as humans, because I know you think of yourself as an actor, director, humanitarian, mm. philanthropist. It's mm. a big, big, big tent there. So do you see yourself as, as responsible for cultivating that part of their development too? Mm -hmm. I see myself responsible for supporting faculty in doing that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's faculty that does that through the way they teach, mm -hmm. through the way they interact with students. Mm -hmm. I see myself as responsible for supporting faculty in doing that. You came here with big aspirations to work hard, put your head down. I know you don't like a lot of attention despite the fact that you are the Felicia Rashad. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but but you, you had goals during your time here and one of them was to bring in high caliber faculty, in addition to the faculty that was already here, mm -hmm. to do the thing that you've been talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, to raise funds, to raise awareness, to raise the college's sort of profile yes. in a lot of ways. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about what you hoped to do in your time here and what you believe you've done? Well, <clears throat> One of the things that I had hoped to do was to create a narrative. A narrative that would expand understanding of what the arts are and their value to humanity and their academic value to this institution because that's not always understood. Oftentimes when people think of the arts, they think of hobby. <laughs> They think of um, talent. They think of getting up and just doing what you do without understanding of the disciplines that are involved and the academic disciplines that are inherent in all the arts. They don't understand <laughs> the discipline of history, psychology, literature, inherent in the arts. They don't understand the discipline and study of chemistry in the arts. They don't understand architecture and engineering in the arts. They don't always understand these things. And that's just a few. Those are just a few of the academic disciplines that are inherent in the arts. You could go on to political science, mm -hmm. anthropology. You could go on and on and on philosophy. Inherent. In theater alone, inherent. Then when you go in, music is mathematics. You know, 
inherent in the arts and in the visual arts. <clears throat> my goodness, my goodness, that's, it's not happenstance. And in its value to humanity, when we want to know something about the way people have lived, you look to the arts and you find it there. You know, going to the museum isn't just a matter of going and looking at a statue or paintings on the wall. When you delve into that and what that is, the time from which it comes, who created that, what was going on, you learn a lot about people. You learn a lot about governments in different parts of the world, in different times, and how that relates to and affects today. The arts are invaluable to human existence. They just are. Before a child can write, hmm? a child sings, a child draws, hmm? As soon as the child can stand, the child is dancing. These things are fundamental to human development. It's just, it isn't because I'm saying it, it's because it is so. And when people don't understand that, it's so easy to devalue the importance of the arts, let's say even in the development, particularly in the development of young people. So, I wanted to create a new narrative. And I wanted students and faculty to embrace this understanding, you know, as opposed to walking around like some people have done over a period of time chirping and chirping about the arts and defending them and, yeah, but you're not really talking about why, you know. You're not sharing the importance of it, why it's important. So that was first and foremost. Mm -hmm. Let's get this understanding straight so that never again is there a time when people say, oh, let's take this unit and put it over here with this one. Mm -hmm. And that was done simply because there was no understanding of the disciplines that are necessary and involved here. This is not easy. These people think, oh, I'm going to take an elective. Let me go over there to fine arts and take this elective. And that's an easy A. Quite to their surprise, it's not. Mm -hmm. And then they get upset, understandably so. <laughs> but it's just the, if I'm telling you, it's just the truth. That was the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Then there are things like, yes, we appointed um, Chairs, new chairs in all departments. Because when I came, there were interim chairs. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was accomplished. Uh, access. Access to opportunity for students. For the past two years, our art students have gone to Art Basel mm -hmm. and exhibited. Mm -hmm. And one of our students was commissioned by the NBA to do an entire series for them. Eric January, who graduated last year and is exhibited in two museums in Chicago today. <laughs> Have you seen the artwork of our students? I've seen some of it. Did you see it in my office? I saw some of those pictures there, but I don't think I realized that that was the work of your students. Oh yeah. Wow. A student art. It's beautiful. They're amazing. Mm -hmm. They're amazing. And then our uh, theater students going to the British American Drama Academy. One of our art students studying in um, Florence. Another art student who's graduating this year in ceramics will go and study for her master's in Japan. More and more and more of this. And supporting faculty, you know. Mm -hmm. Supporting faculty in their development, in their professional and artistic development. These things are very important. Mm -hmm. Ah, affiliations. Last year, we invited Desmond Richardson from Complexions Ballet 
to the College of Fine Arts. He trained our students for two weeks, and then his entire company came to dance with him in the spring recital. Mm. It was unbelievable. And this year was even better than last year. And who knows what next year will be like. These are the things. Taraji P. Henson returned with a mental health initiative. Mm -hmm. And uh, thanks to her, we have a psychologist in our unit. Mm -hmm. These things are important. We have students who travel to Africa every year under the guidance of Dr. Saiz Kamaladeen, seeing those students through. Last year was Senegal, this year was South Africa and Zaire, next year will be something else, and he's been doing it for the past 10 years. Mm -hmm. Increasing those opportunities. I think we're going to have a technical student in um, Theatre Aspen this year, to broaden the horizons, to let them participate on a professional level while they're students. It isn't completely new. It's been happening here. It's just broadening it. That's mm -hmm. all. For decades, you were known as America's mom, yes. right? Yes. And I wonder for young people who watched and were inspired by that role that really expanded your narrative and put you on a bigger map. Mm -hmm. Did your experience here at Howard, was that foundational to what you were able to create through that role? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely my experience was foundational to that. My experience here at Howard is foundational to all the work that I do. It, it begins here. That level of professionalism began right here in this space. Family legacy too, obviously. Family Your sister legacy. Sister Debbie, my Your father, father, Dr. Andrew yeah. A. Allen, the class of '45, College of Dentistry. Yes. Did you have a choice about coming to Howard, or what? Did your parents sort of put the gauntlet down and say, "You're going here"? <laughs> That's what my father said. <laughs> yeah, you can apply anywhere you want, darling, but you're going to Howard. <laughs> That's what he said, and he was so, 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 so right. They, those were exciting. Those four years as a student here were just, it was an incredible time in the country and in the world. Um, wake up calls everywhere you looked, so much energy. Um, and um, you, know, you wanted to be politically astute. You wanted to be an intellectual. You wanted to understand these things, but you wanted to maintain your connection to your grassroots family, mm -hmm. the salt of the earth people from whom I come. Mm -hmm. And that really is foundation. That is foundation for me. The people from whom I come, the people of South Carolina and Louisiana, that, that experience growing up, uh, spending time on a farm, <laughs> gathering eggs, watering cows. <laughs> Spending time in Mexico and yeah, learning another language. Learning another language and experiencing another culture. Mm -hmm. You know, understanding at the age of 13, beyond that which one would read in a book, how expansive the world really is and how people, though um, apparently different, are essentially the same the world over how people really want the same things, really, truthfully. Yeah, they do, they do. But we don't always understand that about each other because, well, I mean, just look how we are with people who live across the street or in the next village or in the next state. Mm -hmm. we, we don't want to, I don't know what that is about us as human beings, reluctant to see ourselves in each other. And that's where the arts comes in. That's where the arts comes in. Because it is, it holds a mirror to all of us about it does, who we are, right? It does, it does, doesn't it? It does. The arts do hold that mirror to who we are. I understand that Broadway is a big passion of yours. <laughs> Might there be a stage in the future for you on Broadway again? And will there, to your point about creating opportunities and pipelines, 
Might mm -hmm. there be another pipeline for Howard students there? Hmm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Did we unlock something here? <laughs> <laughs> yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> yes, it's yes. Yes, simply put, yes. Those, um, those opportunities exist, and um, our students must go for it. Mm -hmm. So what's next? What's next is a good nap, <laughs> a well-deserved nap, Time with my cat, time in my home, time with my family, mm -hmm. time to read, time to refresh, but not much time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, because there's that creative energy in you that you talked about, not wanting to have to leave, right, to come and take this role. So might we see you someplace else? on a different stage, on a big screen or a small one. Well, you've seen me next. there while I've been here. I know, but I'm just <laughs> curious because everyone says, what's next? There people always ask you that, what's next? What's next? As if what you're doing is not enough. <laughs> not enough. <laughs> and I kind of said, okay, you want to know what's next? I don't always know mm -hmm. what's next. Mm -hmm. And I like that because it's what I don't know that interests me most. Mm -hmm. So I don't always know what's next. There are things you think could be next, but that doesn't necessarily mean that is so. You have to see. Yeah. There's work, uh, there's work with my mother's work. Mm. Mm -hmm. My mother has begun some work in Chester, South Carolina with Brainerd Institute Heritage. And um, I will continue that work. Is she still writing? Is she still sharing her gifts through poetry? And the gifts of poetry are there. We have uh, mm -hmm. we published her book Hawk through Clemson University Press. Okay. Um, there was a there was a great celebration on her 100th birthday last mm -hmm. year around the publishing of this book uh, and the release of this book. I. Um, I'm amazed by my mother. Uh huh. And I am so thankful for her. Mm. Yeah. Mother's Day comes very soon. Mm -hmm. And it's a real, it's a real gift to have a mother who loves you and who insists, insists that you insist upon achieving your human potential, who will fight the world for it and fight you specifically for it. Oh yes, she told me. She said, as a mother, you must fight for your children. And sometimes your biggest fight is with your children. That's what my mother says. She is the font of wisdom. With everything that she has given and she has given so much, not just to us. She's given so much to, to young people in Houston and in Mount Vernon. People come and tell me these things all the time. You know, She began a grassroots arts education program that became a model program recognized by Nancy Hanks, who was in the director of the National Endowment of the Arts. Mm. My mother served as on that advisory council, among other things. She's done a lot in many different areas, and, uh, and I'm very proud of her. Yeah, I bet she's very proud of you, too. I hope so. <laughs> I'm sure she is. I hope so. I'm sure she is. I hope so. She's, uh, she's very special. Yeah. She fuel your fight for the children here, young people here? Well, truthfully speaking, I didn't have to fight. Mm -hmm. Some things you don't have to fight about. Sometimes it's just civil conversation. Mm -hmm. And maybe the fight is to believe that you can have that. Mm -hmm. 
It's not always a fight. My God. You're so used to fighting all the time. <laughs> Why? I mean, are we... No. It's not always a fight. Sometimes it's just civil conversation. Earnest, mm -hmm. transparent mm -hmm. conversation. As your young people graduate in just a few days, what do you hope your imprint is on them as they go forth and go out to become the artistic <laughs> and humanitarian ambassadors that you know them to be, having come from Howard University? It's just that that they will be that, that they will trust themselves to continue to grow, that they'll understand that there's never a time when they'll have all the answers, you know, that they move in the world with respect for themselves, always questioning and inquiring what that self is and seeing that self in others that they can bring about a new level of kindness in this world. Do you know there were only two things necessary to solve the COVID problem? Cleanliness and kindness. kindness. Mm -hmm. Two things. Mm -hmm. That's all that was really necessary from the beginning. Two things. Hmm. Hmm. Anything that you wished you had the time to do in the role that you didn't get to? Anything that you would have done over had you had the chance now that you're on this side? Well, there were some things, some things that did not happen, but happened in, a, in another way now that I'm thinking of it. Mm -hmm. We just celebrated Twinkie Clark and Richard Smallwood. What a joy that was. What an amazing evening that was for all of us. And prior to that, um, having been asked by Dean Richardson, Dean of the chapel, to speak in chapel, I said to him, sir, I'm not a clergy person. I'm, I'm not. And I have too much respect for this position to into your pulpit to dare to speak to your congregation, no. But, <laughs> well, but then I thought, what would happen if we curated a service for you? If, I'll, if I know it's curated a service for you. And notice my choice of words. Mm -hmm. Not if I, I curate, mm -hmm. but if fine arts. So I called together some essential people on the faculty. From music, from art from theater, and together we curated a service. And it, the title was We Worship. And why? Because the origin of the arts is worship. That's how all art has its beginnings. It's the truth. And that's what was presented. That's what was offered in that service. And that was so fulfilling. I, How was it received? There's a tape. You can go find it <laughs> it's on YouTube and see for yourself. You go see for yourself, you know. You know, it was a privilege to do. It's a privilege to work with uh, colleagues. In the presentation, in the the tribute to Twinkie Clark and Richard Smallwood, that was in collaboration with Dean Kenyatta Gilbert of the School of Divinity. Mm. Collaboration is everything. That's when things can happen, you know, when you come together and you say, yes, let's do this, we want to do this. And all energies are involved in this. This is how it is in the theater. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are all kinds of personalities. Yes, we know it, except that. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the production, when it comes to the thing, all those personalities and all those energies galvanize towards the success of that thing. Mm -hmm. Is there anything I should have asked you that I did not? I don't think so. 
I know that this was not your first foray into teaching, and I can mention that. I know that you've, you've, you've done the work. You've done some work, right? I also understand that you have some talents that we may not always know about. You play several instruments. I was hoping that maybe you might consider playing something. No. No. <laughs> no. No. No, because there's been no time to practice. Oh. But yes, I've studied and, and played piano, viola, and acoustic guitar. I've studied those instruments. How about a song? How'd you know that? How about a song? I'm a journalist. Oh, of course. <laughs> You're a journalist. Of course you know. A journalist who grew and learned here at Howard University. <laughs> you would expect true. no less. No less. <laughs> That's true. That's true. That's true. How about a song? Uh, <clears throat> with allergies. Oh, come on. Don't do that to me. Okay. All right. Okay. I Read just wanted to... I just against the eastern sky, proudly there on hilltop high, <laughs> far above the lake so blue. Stands old Howard, proud and true. There she stands for truth and right, sending forth her rays of light. Clad in robes of majesty, oh Howard, we hail to thee. <laughs> That was perfect. No, it was not. That was perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. We owe so much to this place. We yeah. do. We do. We do.